right after that, about three more javelina came out of the bushes behind them and started looking around like, hey, whoa, whoa, what was that? What just happened? <laughs> and, and they were looking at this dead javelina in front of them. The Muzzleloaders.com podcast, your source for all things muzzleloader. How's it going, guys? You are listening to the Muzzleloaders podcast, and today we are very excited. We have John McAdams from the Big Game Hunter blog, and today we're going to be talking about javelina hunting um, with with a muzzleloader specifically, which is really exciting. I because I've grown up in Oregon, I don't know very much about javelina hunting, so I'm really excited to get John's perspective on it because I know it's really big down in states like Arizona and places like that. So um, how you doing today, John? I'm doing really good. It is a pleasure being on the, on the podcast with you here today. Well, it's a pleasure having you on. Really excited about uh, the conversation we're going to have today. Yeah, definitely. You know, Havelina are one of those animals I kind of discovered almost by accident while I was uh, deer hunting down in, in New Mexico several mm-hmm. years ago, back when I lived out in that area. And the more I learned about them, the more I saw them and, and whatnot when I was out hunting, the more I was intrigued by them. And, and they're uh, one of those animals that uh, they got a little bit of a bad rap in some ways, but my goodness, they are a lot of fun to hunt. And, For sure. and there's just some really cool opportunities to, to get out there after them. Yeah. Well, do they, so when you're talking about pigs and I know Havelina, they're not really considered a true pig. They're kind of a different like subspecies, but are they as destructive as like some of the pigs that you see down in Texas and down in those other Southern states? Not, not really, you know, so Havelina, you know, so first, first off, they're native species. I'm like feral hogs. They're mm-hmm. not an invasive species. And they're one of those animals, even though they really look like a pig or like a feral hog and they act like them in, in some ways. They're a, they're actually what's called a peccary. And mm. specifically, they're, they're a, the, the javelina that we have here in the United States is called collared peccary because they have a white uh, stripe in their fur that goes al- along their shoulders. Mm-hmm. Uh, that kind of looks like a, you know, like a shirt collar that yeah. they've got. And in, in the scientific classification taxonomy, going from largest to smallest, you have kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and then finally species. They're in the same order as pigs and feral hogs, but Mm -hmm. they're in different families. And so they're in the same order as other even toed ungulates like deer, antelope, cattle, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, But they're, they're, they're really their own kind of weird thing that, um, and like I said, you know, you, if you say you, you know, you told someone you see some pigs over there or something like that, you know, someone in the Southwest would know that you were probably referring to javelinas, (laughs) but it's just kind of one of those interesting facts about them. Mm -hmm. Um, They really like, uh, you know, like I said, since they're native species, they really like a lot of just those native plants, especially prickly pear cactus. That's one of their favorite foods to eat. Hmm. Um, so when you're out out and about in those areas where there's javelina, you'll see them where they'll just tear up a, a patch of prickly pear cactus. Really? You're like, what the heck got after this? <laughs> and um, but you know, I guess they'll you know if there's some agriculture around and whatnot, you know, they'll they'll get into that sometimes. But no, you're not going to see they don't. They don't cause millions of dollars worth of damage to that sort of stuff like uh, like feral hogs do. Yeah, yeah. Well, and the, I think they're you know a lot more of a challenge too to hunt because the feral hogs. I mean, you just go out and just shoot the things, you know. But javelina require a little bit of skill and you know playing of the I mean, they, and stuff. They, they certainly can. You know, they um, you know the hogs. You know, when if you're hunting feral hogs and you're in an area where there's a lot of them, you know, it can be really easy. Uh, it can be really hard. Um, you know, javelina. They kind of just live in in, in that uh, desert environment. Mm-hmm. That everything is just different um, a, a, about them, and and sometimes sometimes it's depending on where they are. They can be really hard to find. Uh, sometimes not. Um, but you know, there's some really uh, cool things about them that I think make them a really fun animal to hunt. Especially, it's one of those deals where uh, you got some new a new person that you're trying to introduce to hunting mm-hmm. or you're trying to learn a new implement, like learn how to hunt with a muzzle loader or a bow for yeah, the first yeah. time They're, I think they're a good animal to, to get started on yeah. uh, like that more so than a deer or an elk. Yeah. And you said you stumbled on them by accident. Like, is there, is there a story behind that where you hunting something else and just happened upon them or. Yeah. You know, so I used to be in the army and so I've lived all over the country. I'm originally from, uh, a little bit north of Houston, Texas. And mm-hmm. so I've lived in a bunch of different states 
out east and then out west. And I lived in Washington State for a long time. And then uh, I got out of the Army. My wife was still in. And then she got uh, moved to Fort Bliss, which is in El Paso, Texas. Mm. And so that first year that we lived there, before we moved down, I knew um, that I was going to be in that area for the, the, the fall hunting season. So I put in for a bunch of hunts in New Mexico, and I drew a deer tag in mm. the southern part of the state. And I was real excited about it. Went out there a couple days ahead of the season of, in October, right before it started. And I was scouting. Um, you know, so like, I think the season started on maybe Saturday. And so I went up on Thursday to scout and I was going to stay mm-hmm. out there until I shot a deer or until the, uh, until the season ended only a five day season. And so I went out there and I was scouting a couple days beforehand. And that first evening I was looking at an area and I didn't see any deer. Um, but I was like, okay, no problem. I'll look at somewhere else tomorrow. And I was, it was in the evening. And so I was walking back to my truck in the dark and, uh, I'm walking along out there, it's pitch black, and the wind is in my face. So I'm walking directly into it, and I hear something rustling in the in the grass in front of me, and then I hear it stop, and then I stop, <laughs> and then I hear this just really kind of scary <clears throat> sound, and something just takes off running <laughs> through the bushes. And I shine my flashlight on it, and I saw just a glimpse of it as it ran away. And I was like, what the heck was that? Yeah. Like, it, it wasn't a bear or a mountain lion or a deer or any of that yeah. stuff. God, it looked kind of like a pig or something like that. So I went back and I started looking in the uh, hunting regulations in my car and I saw that there was javelina in this area. And I was like, gosh, that is probably what it was hmm. that I saw. You know, I had, I had seen them, I'd seen pictures of them before and I'd, you know, run across them in vacations in Arizona and whatnot. But this is the first time I'd ever seen one when I was out hunting. And I started looking at it and I was like, oh, this is interesting. So I got them here. The tags for them are. Um, much less expensive than for a deer or an elk or something like that. And uh, you can get them in certain units to include the unit that I happen to be deer hunting in. You can get them over the counter. Mm. Most animals in New Mexico, you need to uh, put in for a draw for like deer and elk and whatnot. Havelina and Turkey are two that there is a draw for them, but you can also get them in some areas just over the counter. Yeah. And I was like, Oh, this is very interesting. God, it's cool. And so the next day I was out scouting at a different spot for deer and I glassed something up moving over there on this other hillside, maybe 800 yards away. And I was like, what is that? That's not a deer. I was like, oh, that's a, ha- that's a javelina. Oh, there's yeah. another one and another one. And there was a group of four or five of them over there. And I kept seeing these javelina over the course of the week as I was hunting deer mm-hmm. all in the same area. And I realized it was that same group of javelina that I kept just seeing a thousand yards away in different parts of this big basin. Mm-hmm. And they ended up shooting a deer in there and, um, right at the end of the hunt and when I was in there I saw that same group of javelina again and I came back the next year to hunt and I saw them again and all that stuff and so it was one of those things I just kept seeing when I was out there deer hunting I was like you know I'm gonna come out here and I'm gonna I'm gonna actually hunt these javelina myself and so that's what I started doing yeah and do you did you hunt them with with a rifle or I know because I know there's like a close range season that's like in Arizona it's like archery and muzzleloader and stuff so in, in New Mexico, they have an interesting deal where if you draw a deer or an elk tag, you can also get a javelina tag over the counter and hunt them in that same unit, in the same season, and with the same weapon mm. as your deer or elk tag. So if you have a rifle deer tag, you can hunt javelina with a rifle on that hunt. And um, if you don't fill that tag, then you can come back later in the, the season in New Mexico is January, February, March, mm-hmm. and you can hunt them with that same over the counter tag then. And um, during the specific Cavalina season, it's an any weapon. So archery, muzzle loader, rifle. Um, and then, um, but like I said, if you draw an archery deer tag and then you get the Cavalina tag, you have to hunt the Cavalina in October, November, whenever your hunt is with that. Uh, with that uh, weapon. Mm. So I drew a muzzle loader deer tag one year. And so I, I bought a javelina tag and I was carrying my muzzle loader out there. Didn't end up shooting a javelina that year um, during the deer hunt, but I went out, back out in, I think January and I shot one with my rifle. Mm. And then I was like, you know, I got so close to this darn animal. I'm going to try bringing my muzzle loader out next. And so even though I couldn't have used anything, I, I shot the, the muzzle, my most recent javelina with a muzzle loader. And you're right, in Arizona, it's broken up a little bit different where there are some specific archery seasons. There is a, what they call a ham season or a handgun archery muzzleloader mm-hmm. uh, season. And then there's also a general season uh, a little bit later on where you can hunt them with anything to include a centerfire rifle. 
Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and so wh- what muzzleloader do you use to kill it? Like, what's your go-to muzzleloader that you use for, I guess, all your hunting in general? But You know, so it, I, I, ba- I bounce back and forth between two of them. So mm-hmm. I shot this javelina with my CVA Optima. And I was using a power belt bullet in it, and, and it did great. And I'll tell you the story of that javelina hunt in a little bit if you want. But I uh, shot that javelina at about, at about 30 yards. Oh, wow. And that is not unusual to be able to get that close to them. So you could definitely bow hunt javelina if you want. You could definitely shoot them with a traditional muzzle loader if you wanted to. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like the, for this particular hunt, I was going back and forth between whether or not I wanted to use my Optima or my Paramount. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the Optima is a lot lighter and, and just kind of easier to mess around with. And I was like, you know, I'll bet I can get in close enough. Even if I get in with inside a hundred yards, I still, you know, very confident with that Optima. So that's what I'm going to use. And so, you know, I'll use the, uh, the Optima for a lot of my hunting situations in general, where, especially if I'm going to be moving around a lot. And if my, uh, if I'm just real likely anyway to take a shot within, within a hundred yards and mm-hmm. basically for everything else. And for a lot of stuff I've done out West, I, I use the Paramount. Yeah. Yeah. And do you have the, the original Paramount or do you have like one of the newer models? I have the original uh, 45 caliber Paramount. Yeah. There you go. That one, that one's a, that one's a shooter. We have uh, a company guy. Ooh, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's always fun when we take that one out to the range. So mm-hmm. yeah, for sure. Um, and yeah, I, know, I know that javelinas in particular, so I'd heard this and maybe you can set the record straight, but originally they're like a South American species and they eventually moved up over time. Is that correct? I mean, maybe they definitely live, in South America, basically from South America all the way up through Central America and then into Mexico, Texas, New Mexico, mm. and Arizona. It's a little bit different species that they have um, in different parts of their range. But yeah, Havilene are all in that area. And it would not surprise me if if they did, you know, hundreds or probably thousands of years ago if they would have made that migration. For sure, yeah. And I think you, you kind of see that with other species like, you know, bees and stuff like they'll eventually make their way north for some reason I, nobody knows why that is <laughs> but um yeah yeah so i guess when it comes to hunting in, in those other states so like you said you've lived everywhere what has been of all the states you've hunted the most memorable state you think the place you'd love to you know you go back to frequently gosh man it's a good question you know so georgia i lived in georgia for about five years and um i had that was actually my first duty assignment when I, uh, when I got commissioned in the, in the army mm-hmm. and, um, we had, I had a, a, a pick of a, of a bunch of different places I could have gotten assigned. And I was looking at all these places, researching how close it was to my, my family, you know, would just, what it was like living there, what the units were like. And one of the other things I looked at was what the hunting season uh, was like there. Yeah. And Georgia has a super long deer season. It starts in, I think it's like three months long. It goes from oh, like wow. mid October into January and you can shoot 12 deer a year in Georgia. Oh my goodness. And you can shoot, <laughs> you can shoot uh, two bucks and 10 does. They're yeah. unlimited feral hogs. They also have turkey. They also have bear. I actually shot my first bear when I lived in mm-hmm. Georgia. And um, that's just the rifle season I was telling you about. And so right before the rifle season, they have a one week long muzzle loader season. And then right before the muzzle loader season, they have a archery season. I don't bow hunt. So I don't remember exactly when it, uh, when it started, mm-hmm. but I, conceivably, I think you could start hunting with a bow in uh, Georgia in September and then hunt all the way through January and just oh, kind wow. of move through all the weapons. And so that was a lot of fun hunting there. The deer, the deer don't get super big there, but there's a lot of them. And, um, yeah, there was just a lot of good hunting. Like I said there, that was a lot of fun. Washington was really cool, but very, very different from everything that I've been yeah. used to up until that point. Um, but really, living in El Paso was a lot of fun because when I lived there, I hunted Wyoming, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona. All those places were a reasonable drive from, mm-hmm. from El Paso. You know, Wyoming was, it was the same drive distance for me to drive from El Paso to Laramie, Wyoming, as it was for me to drive from El Paso to Houston, Texas. Hmm. Uh, to wow. give you an idea of how, <laughs> how darn big Texas is. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's a long drive to get up to Wyoming, but you can definitely do it. So I had mm. a pronghorn up there. 
and you know all kinds of other stuff. And so that was a you know that was a lot of fun just being in that spot where I had such good access to all of those western states, western yeah. states, and I definitely made the most of it when I was there. Yeah, well, and that's something I've always thought about too is how different and vast the hunting scene is in the United States because in living in Oregon, you know, you might not see 12 deer, you know, it's like, there's all kinds of, mm-hmm. I mean, in the seasons, like 10 days, we're actually in the middle of our deer season, our rifle deer season right now. Um, and it's like 10 days long. And so, but you go to Georgia and you can shoot 12 deer and you can hunt for three months, you know? <laughs> so it's just crazy. Yeah, definitely. It was a big culture shock for me moving from Georgia to Washington, mm-hmm. where I was used to, you just buy a hunting license, then you can get all these animals and you can hunt whatever, whatever season you want. Um, you just have to use the appropriate you know, legal method of take for whatever mm-hmm. that season is. In Washington, you have to pick which season and you get to, you know, if you pick muzzle loader, you only get to hunt with a muzzle loader for deer or yeah. elk or whatever, whatever it is the year. And you get to shoot one animal yeah. uh, unless you, happen to draw one of those you know uh bit rare uh, second deer tags where you get to shoot a doe or something like that mm-hmm. in certain parts of the state um and then you know the, the upside upshot to washington was there was a lot of public land up there and some interesting and unique animals i never hunted before like uh, mule deer uh, mm-hmm. that were up there and black field deer i just hunted white field deer up until that point yeah and uh, but actually, it was my experience in Georgia that actually spurred me to start hunting with a muzzle loader to begin with, mm. uh, because um, that uh, I, you can hunt hogs all year long there. And so at the time, I was I was not married, and so my friend and I we would just go out hunting uh, hogs all all year long through the summer and everything. And so as we were messing around out in the swamps in Georgia, we would uh, run across all these uh, great places to hunt deer. We would yeah. see deer all the time when we were hog hunting. So we're always marking these spots on our GPS. Like, okay, this is going to be great when deer season starts. And then uh, when deer season would start, the rifle season, there'd be people everywhere yeah. out there. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> all these great spots that we found, someone else has found first. Yeah. And so we got the bright idea that we were going to start hunting with a muzzle loader because we reasoned that most people weren't. And it turned out to be true. And get out there and get that one week where we can kind of take advantage of of that opportunity to hunt deer in all these spots before they get pushed around uh, when the when the, the the orange hordes hit the woods in yeah. October or late October and it, it really worked out well for us. We had a lot of a good success there, and then I kind of carried that on uh, when I moved up to Washington. Yeah, and that's that's something we always talk about here on the show and just amongst ourselves at, at our company is that there's so much opportunity in muzzleloader hunting because there's so few people that do it, you know, relatively speaking to like rifle season or even archery, you know, there's so much opportunity countrywide for muzzleloader hunting. That's absolutely true. And, you know, like I said, we got into that in Georgia. And then when I realized I was going to be stationed up at Fort Lewis near Tacoma, Washington, I started looking uh, at the opportunities in Washington and I saw that, um, Washington Fish and Wildlife will post harvest reports online every year. And I realized that according to their stats, only about 7% of the deer hunters in the state use the muzzleloader, hmm. where um, maybe 17 or 18% would use archery equipment. And then the rest, you know, we're talking over 70% of the hunters there use the rifle each year. Man. And interestingly enough, the, uh, the amount of time that they spent in the field uh, to get a to take a deer and their just overall success rate was very very similar and so at the time washington had pretty strict regulations um you know you had to you kind of like what you have to deal with in oregon now yeah. with um, the ignition being exposed to the elements and all that stuff but and you couldn't you couldn't and you still can't use a scope uh, but even so i reasoned you know this with especially as thick as it is in western washington hunting black tailed deer i don't think that's that big of a of a handicap. And yeah. So I got into it and I ended up shooting uh, several deer and even a bear in Washington when, uh, with my mother loader. And I had a lot of really good success. I'm really glad I did that. Mm-hmm. Um, because for a lot of, for a lot of the same reasons that I got into it in Georgia, not only are there just not a lot of people that do it, but that deer season in Washington with the muzzle loader happened before the rifle season. And so yeah. you kind of got a chance to get out there before, before everyone from Seattle and Tacoma hit the woods. For sure. Yeah. And I'm guessing like how, how long ago was that that you were living in Washington? I lived in Washington from 2012 to 2017. 
Got it. Okay. And so were you still using the Optima then, or did you have a different muzzle loader you were using? So my very first muzzle loader that I bought when I lived in Georgia, I bought a Thompson Center New Englander. Mm-hmm. And I hunted with that for a little while. And then I didn't, I, I wasn't super happy with it. It was legal to use up there. And I had a little bit of success with it in Georgia, but it was just, you know, just hard. Um, mm-hmm. And I wanted something that was, uh, just a little bit more capable and newer. And this one that I had, like I said, it was used and it had not been taken a good, the person that owned it before me had not taken good care of it. <laughs> you got to be and careful. So with used muzzle loaders. <laughs> a, yeah, that's definitely true. You know, it was a, it was a good one to learn on. Uh-huh. I learned a lot of really good fundamentals uh, working with it. Uh, but I ended up buying a uh, CVA Wolf Northwest when I was up there, mm. hunted with it for a couple seasons. Then I got the Optima Northwest. And, um, and then for both of those, I ended up buying, uh, 209 conversion kits and, and switching them over, uh, to use 209s. And so that is the Optima that I still do most of my hunting with, with a muzzle loader to this day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the Optima is great. I mean, that'll, that's, you know, you think about these entry level and mid level muzzle loaders. Oftentimes people are like, oh, you know, it's just a throwaway gun, but those, the Optimas and the Wolves are excellent. You know, they do, they do a great job. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I really, really like that muzzle loader. For sure. Yeah. And I guess, you know, I kind of changed the subject here, but, uh, we were talking about javelina hunting. Um, you know, if I'm a total novice, so if I wanted to go down to like Arizona, um, and hunt javelinas, what am I looking at? Like, what do I need to prepare myself for? You know, what's the, obviously it's like a desert climate. Like what are the things you need to know before Mm -hmm. you head down there? So javelina, uh, live in like a desert scrub grassland, uh, type terrain Mm -hmm. and uh primarily in the southern part of arizona and new mexico and you know like i said they really like to eat prickly pear cactus and so that is a kind of a good indicator to look for when you're doing some scouting Mm -hmm. and there's they live in a lot of different places uh down there and there's there is a lot of them they eat all kinds of stuff you know they'll they'll eat lizards and insects insects on occasion but they're mainly eating things like mesquite beans roots and especially cactus and they really get after that cactus so if you're finding um a lot of javelina tracks with some prickly pear cactus that have been eaten with some prickly pear cactus that haven't been eaten that is a really good sign that you're looking at an area that's got you know a good population of javelina in it Mm -hmm. now they live in groups um, it is un- it is possible, but unusual to find a javelina by itself. Usually, they're going to be in groups of four, five, six, eight, sometimes bigger. You know, you'll I've heard of groups of twenty to fifty javelina in a group. But most of the ones <laughs> I've seen have been fi- have been five to ten. Uh-huh. Um, their their tracks look like a deer track, just much smaller. They're hmm. about just a little over an inch long. They're not big animals. Wow. There may be two. They're about two feet tall at the shoulder, and they'll weigh 30 to 40 pounds, full grown. Um, they do get bigger than that. I actually know a guy, a friend of mine, Joseph von Benedict. His brother shot one in Texas, I don't know how long ago, but several years ago that weighed over 60 pounds, and that was a massive heavily. Wow. <laughs> uh, but even at, even at that, 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 that's still not that big of an animal, yeah, you know, 50, yeah. 60 pounds. Um, depending on how you define big game, and whether or not you include turkey in that, javelina are usually considered the smallest species of big game. Yeah. Um, so because they're not big animals, it's it can be hard to spot them sometimes because they, uh, they're they just so low to the ground. It doesn't take a lot of grass or brush to, to obscure them. Mm-hmm. And so one of the, the best advice that I can give you is to check out some areas um, see if they've got those indicators that I was telling you about, about javelina uh, habitat, especially that cactus that they like. And if you're seeing a fresh sign like tracks or poop, you know, their, their scat looks like a, look, looks like dog poop, just once again, smaller. Mm. That's a good sign. And if, if you find fresh signs, as long as no one's really messed with them, they're probably not going to be that far away. Mm-hmm. they don't have a gigantic home home range. So if you're finding fresh sign, they're probably within a mile of you, maybe closer. And like I was saying with those javelina that I kept seeing on my deer hunt, gosh, they were, I kept over the course of about a week, I saw that same group of javelina within about a 1000 yard radius, just over and over again. Mm-hmm. And so they'll, they'll eat over here. 
and then move over here and move over here and all that stuff and kind of just work in that same general area. And so if you're looking hard enough in there and you're seeing that fresh sign, you're probably going to find them. Yeah. But like I said, they can be tough to spot. Uh, if the wind is just right and you're close enough, you might be able to smell them. And quite often you will hear them, uh, their vocalizations, even if you can't see them. And more than once, um, I've, I've heard them fighting and grunting at each other and that sort of thing. And that's cued me in on, okay, there's javelina in here. And, and I've been able to find them after that, you know, you know, like with that javelina I bumped into at night and several times I've just been walking around out there, uh, going to and from my truck or something like that on a deer hunt. And I've heard them grunting at each other. Like I said, they live in groups and, so they'll be fighting and things like that over food. One of them will find some food and start working on it. Another one will come in and then they'll fight, try and run each other off. <laughs> so that is not, that's not an un- uncommon uh, thing to, to run into out there. And if you're in an area where you, you know, in the Southwest where they might live, you might hear that sort of stuff when you're out deer hunting or something yeah. and be like, what the heck is that sound? <laughs> it, it could very well be a javelina. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that, Oh, go ahead. No, that's fine. Go ahead. I was just going to say, like, I think that with the javelinas, like, when, when is the best time to hunt them? Because it's, it's my understanding from YouTube that they'll come out in the morning, sun themselves, try and warm up, and then they'll kind of go about their day. Is it easier to find them first thing in the morning when they're trying to get warm? So it depends. Uh, you know, the designated javelina season in – New Mexico and Arizona runs January, February, and in, in, into March in, in uh, New Mexico. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, it can be a little chilly uh, that time of year. And they are not well-insulated animals. And so they are mainly diurnal. So they'll be up during the day. If it's really, really hot, um, they might be feeding at night. But for the times that you're most likely to be hunting them, they're going to be up during the day. And if it's really cold or really windy, um, they will sleep in a little bit in the morning and um, they will hit those real sunny areas first, if, especially if it's cold, because, you know, like I said, they're just not real well insulated animals. Yeah. If it's really windy or something like that, they're going to be a little skittish and they're going to try and be in areas where the, the wind, they're a little bit more sheltered from the wind, especially mm. if it's really cold outside. And so, um, when I hunt them, uh, when I'm hunting javelina specifically, I do like to get out there early, but you don't have to be up super, 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 super early like you do with deer. Uh-huh. Um, if you're up there and ready to go as it's getting light, as the sun is actually coming up and hitting the hillside, that's usually early enough. Yeah. And look, they will sleep in canyons and caves and things like that. So look around those areas first. And more than once I've been, uh, say deer hunting or even have a lead hunting and looking, looking, looking and did not really seeing anything. And then all of a sudden when the sun actually starts hitting a, uh, a particular area where, as it turns out, they were bedding, they just start boiling up out of that Canyon uh, and, and, and being in the sun. And it seems like they were just waiting for that to happen mm-hmm. so they could get out and, and, and get warm and they'll move around all day long. If it's real hot, you know, they'll bed down a little bit in the, uh, in the afternoon at the hottest part of the day. But if it's, you know, if you're, you know, it doesn't get super cold in Arizona, usually, especially in the Southern part of the state, um, or same thing with New Mexico. Uh, but it will get chilly, you know, it'll get down around freezing and whatnot, maybe, maybe a little bit lower, but, um, on days like that during Havelina season, they'll often be up all day long in, in more sunny spots. You know, mm-hmm. like I said, and they'll, they'll eat all day long and then, you know, go to bed, uh, right as the sun goes down and kind of do it, uh, do that every, every single day. Um, so like I said, yeah, you know, like you, like you mentioned, look in the sunny areas and look in the warm areas, look in the areas that are more sheltered, uh, from the wind if it's really windy. Yeah. And you say they're, they're pretty small. So uh, do they taste like, like you'd think a pig would taste or is the meat like taste different somehow? They're kind of their own thing. You know, so they do have, especially if you shoot a big boar, they can shoot, they can have a pretty strong smell to them. And they have a scent gland on their back uh, that that makes a lot of that odor. And so the best advice that I can give someone that was trying to have them uh, eat, one, eat one and have it taste good is to bring two knives with you and then like two sets of gloves and, and, and that sort of thing. When you get one down, find that scent gland on the back, cut it out, 
and then put that knife and those gloves away and then use your other one hmm. uh, to do the rest of the butchering. So you don't get that, that uh, whatever it is that's on it uh, um, uh, in, in the rest of the meat. And if you do that, and then if you take good care of the meat, put it on ice, that sort of thing, the meat will be fine. That's not the best tasting meat I've ever had in my life, but I cook it a lot like I cook pork and that sort of thing. I, yeah. I do a lot of slow cooking for it. Uh, pulled pork makes really good uh, tacos, that sort of thing. Yeah. Do you, do you have to fight like toughness and gaminess like you do with deer or is it pretty good just the way it is? You know, since I primarily slow cook it, that has not been an issue for me. I have not tried cooking it any other way than that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I know we actually just did a podcast here a week or a week or so ago about elk and deer and gaminess and like how to cut it up correctly and all that kind of stuff, you know, cause people have a lot of complaints about that. Yeah, definitely. And javelina are an animal that, like I said, they've got a little bit of a reputation that's not entirely undeserved, you know, for tasting bad. Mm -hmm. Because if you do it wrong, yeah, it could absolutely (laughs) be some pretty nasty meat. So you got to be careful with it. So, like I said, be real careful with that gland. And then you got to be especially careful with just cooling that meat down. Um, You know, especially like you shoot one in September or October or something like that, where it can be kind of warm, like Mm -hmm. that thing. You know, kind of like with a pronghorn um, in, in, in certain states. You, know, you shoot it where it's, where it's warm. You got to be on the ball real quick, uh, taking care of it, or mm. it can it can go bad on you. Yeah, that's that's true, and that's that's one, another thing I don't have a ton of experience with because in Oregon it takes like twenty years to draw an antelope tag. You know, whereas in Wyoming you can just go shoot a bunch of them, <laughs> however many you want. So, yeah, um, yeah. You know, I, I I drew my have or my uh, not my have tag. My pronghorn tag was one point. You know, in Oregon, you can, that not in Oregon, in in Wyoming. Okay, in, so uh, in, like, man, you are one lucky guy. <laughs> no, I, uh, I Oregon is one of the states I just have never applied in. Uh, hmm. But yeah, you can you can do a lot of really good pronghorn hunting with just just a handful of points in, in Wyoming. Yeah, that's something that's definitely on uh, on my list of things to do here in the next next couple of years. You know, do you ever hunt them with a muzzleloader, mm-hmm. or have you just always rifle hunted them? So I've only rifle hunted them and really the, my last pr- pronghorn hunt that I went on came out It happened right before I got my paramount. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, 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 if I were to do it again and I very well might, uh, I would take my paramount on that. For sure. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the tough thing is I know a lot of people like my brother-in-law killed one with a bow and it's like, that's tough, you know, and you see on Instagram, people are like stalking up on them, like crawling through brush Ooh, and stuff like that's that's a whole different thing, you know, <laughs> that it, def- it definitely is, you know, that's, that's its whole, whole different ball game. You know, I mean, it's really actually kind of the, uh, the opposite of Havelina where Havelina, in my experience, finding them initially has been hard, mm-hmm. but they're not super hard to, to get close to. Whereas the pronghorn, in my experience, they're very easy to find, but it, they're really hard to get close to if yeah. you're, if you're not careful or if they're in an area where, uh, where they're hunted real heavily and, and that sort of thing. You know, so with Havelina, once you find them, um, like with anything, you got to be very, very careful with the wind. They mm-hmm. have excellent noses. And so they like to quite often feed into the wind. You know, you'll see a couple of them in there together, and they'll be milling around, but generally moving in, in, a, in a certain direction, usually into the wind. Yeah. So um, my most recent Havelina hunt uh, was ac- actually kind of describes things, describes things pretty well. It was very cold, very windy uh, when I was there. You know, cold for that part of the country anyway. And mm-hmm. so it was getting down around freezing and dealing with very strong winds, like 30 gusting up into the 40s, uh, which yeah. is not uncommon that part of New Mexico. And where I hunt uh, quite often, what I'll have to deal with is I'll have one or two days where just ridiculous wind, very, very strong wind, like so strong that it is almost hard to glass because even on a tripod, your, your binoculars are shaking. Mm-hmm. And then you'll have a couple of days of that, and then just one or two days were just absolutely beautiful weather, clear blue skies, almost no wind, and so everything kind of come, comes out and starts eating and all that yeah. stuff. And on this particular hunt, you know, I'll, I'll tell you the story of it here in a second. I shoot this javelina on the windy day, and then I'm driving out the next morning. It was beautiful weather, and I think I saw 30 deer on my drive out out that day. Uh, <laughs> everything was hunkered down a little bit when it was very windy and it was all uh, going out and eating and all that stuff um, when it calmed down. And so what I try and do is, you know, I will hunt on the windy days 
uh, but it's really kind of a process of elimination where that first afternoon I went out there, okay, we'll see what it's like at this spot. And just super windy, not a lot moving. All right, I'm going to try this other spot. Maybe the wind will be a little different there. And so mm-hmm. the next morning I go hunt there, same deal. Um, but I was starting to kind of zero in. I was like, all right, the wind is coming this direction. And it's been pretty steady and strong in that way. If I move up this canyon a little bit, it's going to turn. And uh, maybe up there, it'll be a little bit more sheltered and I'll, and I'll have some better luck. Yeah. So uh, as I'm working in, finding out where everything is not, you know, I'm, I'm kind of narrowing down my options. And so that evening I get up to a different area. And sure enough, it's still a little bit of wind going on there, but that, that part of the canyon, much more sheltered. Mm-hmm. And so I set up there and I was glassing and glassing. And I'm immediately seeing deer in there. Okay, great sign. Um, and then I hear some javelina start to vocalize and fight with each other, grunt, and squeal yeah. out in front of me. And I can't see them, but they're in this area where I'm looking. Like, okay, I'm seeing deer here. I'm, I'm hearing javelina. They're here. They ain't, they ain't that far. So I keep watching, watching, watching. And then I see a javelina pop up over the ridge in front of me, five, 600 yards away. And I was like, okay, here we are. You know, I thought they were here. That was the same general location where I'd heard them. And so, okay, now I know that they're here. Start making my stock. And so I get everything ready. And uh, luckily the wind at that point was still very steady and it was blowing across. So say from right to left and uh, which was perfect. And they, they came, came up over this ridge in front of me, feeding more or less into the wind. And so, uh, but it gave me a good opportunity to get in, get in behind them and, uh, and make a stalk on them. So yeah. I got all my stuff together, went down uh, to the bottom of the canyon in front of me, started climbing up. And I had marked this javelina on my, uh, on Onyx. And they were uh, where I thought they were based on the direction and the, and the distance. And so as I got within about 100 to 150 yards of that spot, I really slowed down. Mm-hmm. And um, like I said, their nose is their primary deal, um, means of defense. But, um, you know, they, they're not blind and they can hear very, fairly well, too. So since they live in a group, um, something like um, a stick breaking or a rock rolling doesn't really get them upset. Uh, but if they hear metal on metal or a zipper or Velcro, that will put them on edge. And mm. um, same thing if they see you. If they see just a little bit of movement, it's not necessarily going to get them uh, real excited, but uh, you still need to be real careful. Yeah. And so I, 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 gosh, I slowed way down, started creeping in on them, and I got to where I thought they were, and they weren't there. But uh, I knew the direction they were moving, so I started slowly walking that direction into the wind at this point. And I was like, okay, uh, things are going okay. Hopefully they're just feeding into the wind and I'll just catch up to them here in a minute. And at that point, I hear them grunting and squealing again in front of me, just kind of out of the blue. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, they're they're a lot closer this time. They are where I think they are. And so I start moving in that uh, direction. And then um, I see something move ahead of me and it's, oh, it's Havelina. And he was kind of feeding in a little bit of a circle in front of him and totally focused on eating. He would uh, munch over here for a couple minutes and then move a couple feet and really start munching. And there was a bunch of, uh, uh, I think, nuts or berries that had fallen off some trees in that area very recently. And I think that's what he was eating. Mm-hmm. He was about 50 yards away at this point. And so I decided, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoot this javelina. I'm going to get a little closer, um, move from cover to cover uh, with these bushes that are out there. And I'll get as close as I can. And then I'll take the shot. And then I moved. He went. I got down to about 30 yards. And uh, I kind of ran out of cover. There was nothing else between him and me. And uh, so, okay, this is, I'm going to, I'm going to make this shot here. He turned broadside, cocked my muzzle loader. I fired and I shot him and uh, right behind the shoulder. He made two big loops running right there and then just boom, killed over dead. Yeah. And um, right after that, about three more javelina came out of the bushes behind them and started looking around like, Hey, whoa, whoa, what was that? What just happened? <laughs> and and they were looking at this dead javelina in front of them. And uh, I actually got a really good video of it on my phone as I walked up on them. So I only had one. You can only shoot one javelina in New Mexico. So I was done hunting at yeah. this point. If I would have had a, had a friend with me, uh, we definitely could have doubled or even tripled on these javelina potentially yeah. as they were there. <laughs> and I walked up on them and these javelina, uh, they keyed in on me. And then the hair on their back stood up. And 
uh, I started yelling at him to get him to leave because it was starting to get dark and I wanted to take pictures and be able to put put her in the tabellino while there was still a little bit of light. Mm -hmm. And um, I got within maybe 10, 15 yards of him. And then they finally ran off and started running at me. And uh, then I started messing with the javelina that I killed, uh, getting ready to butcher him. And then three more javelina came out of the bushes <laughs> uh, right right by him, and I had to scare them off too. But just goes to show that they're usually running a group, mm -hmm. and in that kind of terrain that they were in, um, you can often see one, but who knows how many that there are going to be that you can't see that may be real close by. And so there are yeah. definitely cases that I've run into myself where I'll focus in on the one I can see move in on it and then bump another one that I didn't see there that was 10 yards away instead of 50 and had that one kind of scare the whole group off so it's something to, to really keep in mind and that it's hard but not to get uh, target focused too much uh, tunnel vision zeroed in on that one because who knows what's real close to you I have I've always stopped hunting after you know because I only have that one tag so every time I've shot a javelina that's, that's the end of my hunt um, I would wager in this area, at least that I was in, there wasn't a lot of hunting pressure there. So um, especially since they really liked that area, had all the food and everything and cover that they needed, I would wager that maybe within a day or two, uh, they probably would have really settled down and, and, and someone else could have kind of gone back in there and, and, and maybe gotten another one out of that group if they would have wanted to. Um, like I said, unless they're really pushed hard, they're not going to leave an area completely. They're not going to go into the next county, usually. Mm. Um, and so it's, it, it is an area where you can have usually have success over and over again, especially if you're careful with it. Yeah. Um, but if you're hunting in a group, um, you know, you and a buddy hunting there and, and one of you shoots one, it's definitely worth considering or being real careful after you shoot that, uh, that first javelina and, um, maybe keep your celebrating and high-fiving and all that stuff. Just hit pause on that for a minute. Yeah. Uh, because you never know what's going to pop out of the brush. Uh, and that, that second guy could, you know, get one as well. Mm -hmm. And I've had plenty of opportunities or plenty of, um, uh, times where I've been out there and, uh, shot or rather gotten very close to Havelina within 50 yards, sometimes with even within 10 yards. And so they're an animal that, uh, you could definitely hunt them with a bow, and you know, like a like I just talked about, definitely hunt them with a muzzleloader if, if that's something that you that you want to. In Arizona, they have that season as well, where you can hunt them with a handgun uh, too, if that was something you were interested in. Yeah. Um, because just the very nature of how they do things, the fact that um, there's often a lot of action in their hunts and all of that stuff, and they're not extremely difficult to stalk. It's something that's you know worth considering if you have a uh, uh, a child or just someone that's uh, new getting into hunting or if you just want to practice your um, spot and stalk hunting they're a good animal to do that on because they are a little bit more forgiving uh, than a deer or an elk would be of you making noise or you know just moving a little bit too much something like that there's a lot mm -hmm. of stuff that you can do with a javelina getting in close that you couldn't do with a mule deer uh, for instance and um and like i said too if you mess it up They'll move several hundred yards, but they're not going to be gone, gone. And uh, you can you can try again and do it. Get in some reps uh, doing that, uh, that, like I said, you wouldn't be able to do with another animal. And so there's a lot of people that will, especially down in the Southwest, um, there's a lot of kids down here that that's like the first animal that they ever hunt is a, is a javelina. You kind of learn, learn how to do that where the stakes aren't quite so high. And it's yeah. a good way to get in some reps. Or if you were interested in hunting with a muzzleloader, for instance, and never done it before, you know, get a muzzle loader and uh, spend some time at the range and then, you know, go to Arizona or New Mexico or something and, and spend a little bit of time hunting them and, and, and get some reps and hopefully have a javelina under your belt before you go after deer or elk with it. Yeah, for sure. And um, you said they're really noisy. Uh, it's like you could hear them from 600 yards away making all kinds of racket, you know. Is there any, because I know like with yeah. elk, you know, with elk at least, for myself, I don't usually concern myself with making a bunch of noise, breaking sticks and stuff. Um, if you come in on javelina and you're kind of like making noise, breaking sticks, is that does that put them on edge? Or like if you're making a bunch of noise, or do you still want to try and be relatively quiet? Yeah, uh, natural noises like a rock rolling or a stick breaking usually aren't going to put them on edge, mm -hmm. unless you're being just ridiculous about it. Um, but something like that, you know, they live in a group and so they're used to having other animals yeah. move around them. 
and they and they live in areas where deer and things like that live too and in many places cattle uh live as well like this area where i hunt them a lot um you know it's not uncommon for people to be grazing cattle out there and all that stuff so that sort of thing not usually going to bother yeah. um you you break a stick or something like that don't concern yourself too much about it but you bang your uh, your rifle on something or you do some velcro real loud you, you definitely don't want to be doing that for sure yeah those unnatural noises that you know like car doors mm-hmm. and stuff like that yeah definitely um i have never called javelina myself some people do um i have heard that that can be a very effective way of doing it um in certain areas this this hasn't been an issue for me in most of the places i've hunted where it's been open enough where I can see them Mm -hmm. and then get in reasonably close and still still find them. But there are some places where it's just so darn thick uh, that that's really, really hard to do. And in those cases, um, I've heard of cases where people will go and they'll get in close to where they think javelina are and then blow like on a javelina distress call, for instance. Hmm. And if they have not been educated to that uh, before, that can be a good way to really bring them in um, to see what the heck is going on. Uh, there because you know like i said if it's kind of thick like that they're used to being in a group of javelina Mm -hmm. and um they're not necessarily going to have real good tabs on okay yeah my buddy fred's over here and jim's over there (laughs) and all that stuff and so if they hear something that sounds like a javelina that's you know close enough that it it could be you know they'll they'll run in there and try to figure out what the heck is going on interesting likewise i've also heard people is that kind of like a predator call type deal like you know Kind of right, you know. To I, like I said, I've never done it myself, but I've heard that there are calls that you can buy that mimic the sound of a javelina in distress, hmm. and so you you can kind of get that uh, that reaction that you would. Um, but in, in that in that same vein, I've also heard people you get in close to the javelina and you bump them and they start running away. Sometimes you can salvage it by blowing on that distress call to get them to come back. And oh no, you know something scared us, but it's getting one of us, so we're going to go try and uh, defend it. Oh wow. Huh. That's crazy. Havelina aren't going to hurt you. They can they can be pretty intimidating and scary and whatnot, especially when they kind of explode out of the brush in front of you. Uh, they're like I said, they're real noisy. Sometimes yeah. they'll be popping their jaws and whatnot. They do have tusks. Um, you know, the, actually, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll show you something here real quick. Uh, so this is a uh, a skull from one of the Havelina that I've, that I've shot, and I'll hold it up to the camera here, and you can. You can see the tusks on it. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, they get you know, de- decently big, not as big as a feral hog, but they're also not as big as a feral hog. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, like I said, that can be scary if you have one of them just kind of running straight at you out of the brush. They're, they're probably not trying to hurt you. Usually what happens is you shoot one of them or you scare them or something, and they know something's wrong. And especially if they didn't see you to begin with, They'll just explode out of the brush and just run every which direction. And sometimes it's directly <laughs> at you. Yeah. And usually that's just because they don't know what the heck is going on more than they're trying to hurt you. So you stand your ground and you, and you yell at them and they'll just kind of veer off to the side. But it yeah. can be a pretty uh, intimidating uh, deal at first if you're not expecting it. <laughs> I feel sure. like I was that, that, that first night that I uh, ran into them <laughs> or some other encounters that I've had with them in the dark, just walking back to my truck. Uh, yeah. I didn't know they were there and they didn't know I was there. Yeah, I mean, everything's scarier in the dark, you know. The The first cougar I ever saw, mm-hmm. I was turkey hunting, and it ran right across the road in front of me, and then I, like, pulled around the side and parked to go to my turkey spot at, like, 4 in the morning, just pitch dark, you know. Every stick breaking is a cougar at that point, you know. It's, Ooh, <laughs> it's man. Like, yeah, In your definitely. mind, at least. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. You know, so, um, let me think here. So, in Arizona, um, you have to – there are some, there are some over-the-counter archery tags that you can get for javelina there and they do overlap with the archery coos deer uh, season there mm-hmm. so actually there's a friend of mine that i actually got that he turned me on to coos deer hunting in arizona and um, what he would do was uh, buy a javelina and a deer tag and go down and hunt in arizona in uh, i think january is when he would do it early january and then quite often there were there were a couple of years where he'd uh, shoot javelina and a deer on that same hunt and, you know it was great um other than that, you have to put in for a draw in Arizona for the rest of the javelina tags. They have a youth season that runs right after the archery season in late January. They have that ham hunt 
uh, that I was telling you about the handgun archery muzzle loader hunt mm-hmm. that runs in early February. And then they have the general season in late February for all those you have to apply. And the deadline to do that is usually in October. It's a, it's a weird deal that they do in mm-hmm. Arizona. Um, so it's actually coming up just you know next week as we're, as we are recording this. That's when they have the deadline for their bison, turkey, javelina, and maybe something else uh, is then. But so if you want to hunt in Arizona and you don't want to go on one of the over the counter archer over the counter archery tags, keep that in mind. And uh, usually those tags aren't super hard to draw, especially that ham hunt. Um, but like I said, just something to keep in mind. Yeah, New Mexico, they have like a mix of over the counter and uh, draw. Their deadline is in March, and um, the season runs depending on which exact tag you get January through March. So March of 2022 would be the deadline to apply for the hunts that following uh, year. Mm. But like I said, you can get over the counter tags in many of the units in the state. And uh, especially in the Southern part of the, of the, of the state, I've always hunted on an over the counter tag. You can get those, you know, kind of just anytime. And, and like I said, you can also combine them with your deer or your elk hunt. Yeah. Uh, in October, November, whenever your hunt is there, that's a, something definitely to keep in mind. Uh, but it's, uh, and then in Texas, I've never hunted them in Texas. Um, uh, and there's a lot of private land in Texas. So I know there are places, especially in the Southern part of the state where, uh, a lot of people will, will uh, shoot a javelina while they're deer hunting, uh, mm-hmm. cause the season runs basically all year long and you can, you get the tags with your regular hunting license in Texas and, um, you can shoot two of them a year in, in Texas. But, you know, some, like I said, uh, public land is an issue there, but that, that's the three states where you can hunt them in the U.S. You can also hunt them, I guess, in, in old Mexico as well, though I've never done that. Yeah, yeah. And um, it's interesting that, you know, you say hunting them in Mexico. Uh, have, you, have you ever hunted Mexico? Never have, no. Yeah, I, I've actually recently been turned on to some of the things that they've, you know, there's a lot of good hunting down there. Because it's, essentially it's just like hunting in New Mexico and Arizona, you know, you're just in a different country, so you have to fight with some of that stuff. But definitely something I'd like to try one of these days. Yeah, I've heard it can be especially good for coos deer and uh, mule deer. Mm-hmm. For sure, yeah. Um, and I know, so did you have anything else on javelinas that you wanted to make sure we we know about and our community knows about? You know, like I said, those seasons are in January, February, and, 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 and March in New Mexico. So mm-hmm. that is when most of the hunting seasons in most states are over. Yeah. And especially if you live up north, um, it is winter down there and it does get cold, but it's usually much nicer in that part of the country <laughs> in January, February than it can be in Minnesota or North Dakota or whatever. For sure. Um, so there's a lot of people that just go down there uh, and enjoy those hunts, um, you know, uh, enjoy the nice weather, nice hunting opportunity down there, just give you something to do in a time of year where there's usually not a lot going on. And yeah. um, so, you know, for, for those, there are all kinds of reasons to look into doing it, but that's just another one. Yeah, for sure. That's awesome. And I know you normally, yeah, that time of year is coyote hunting time in Oregon. So <laughs> there's not much else going on. <laughs> so, yeah, may, you know, maybe a little bit of waterfowl hunting, uh, yeah, depending yeah. on where you are and the season ends, all that stuff. But yeah, things are starting to really to, to wind down then. And especially February can be a really uh, tough time to be a hunter uh, yeah. in a lot of those places. You're really starting <laughs> to go into withdrawal after deer and elk season and all that stuff is over. But turkey and bear haven't quite started yet so yeah. you know look into something in the in there for sure yeah that's definitely definitely something i'm going to check out so um i also kind of want to know a little bit about the big game hunter blog and some of the stuff that you do uh in the outdoor industry and like you know what it is that uh you know i know you say you do like a intro to muzzle loading type stuff and you know i was wondering if you want to talk mm-hmm. about that a little bit yeah definitely you know so i um started the big game hunting blog in 2012 Mm -hmm. and I've started off sharing some of my hunting stories on there. And um, then I started writing about some of my current hunting experiences. And actually uh, the way I kind of got, got got to know you guys at uh, muzzleloaders.com was I bought that CVA wolf just kind of as a regular guy wanted to learn how to hunt with it. And I started documenting uh, the process and my experiences as I figured out what worked in it, what powder, primer, bullets all work together mm. and uh, sharing that stuff on there just kind of as a person learning how to use a muzzle motor. And so I got to know Brad uh, that way. And um, I've continued to document a lot of my hunts and, and whatnot on the blog that way. 
And I also, um, in addition to hunting with a muzzle loader, I do a lot of centerfire rifle hunting. And one of some of the most popular stuff that I do on the blog is a lot of uh, cartridge and caliber comparisons. So I talk about the 270 versus the 30 out six, the 300 win mag and the seven mag, um, and the 6.5 Creedmoor versus everything on yeah. there. You know, the <laughs> pros and cons of, of each one of those. And we're, you know, we're, what situations it makes sense to be using it, uh, 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 using this one versus that one. And, if you're going to be using this cartridge for hunting animals under these circumstances, yeah, maybe this is uh, the the ammo or the rifle that you should be looking into doing. Yeah. Um, in that same vein, um, you know, like I said, I've always hunted with a muzzle loader. I started hunting with a muzzle loader in 2011, so it's been about 10 years now as we're recording this, and I started doing that as a way to expand my hunting opportunities, and especially with everything that's happened, gosh, in the last year and a half with COVID mm-hmm. and all that stuff, all the craziness going on in the world and with just so many more people buying guns and hunting. Um, that's something that I've really put a lot of time and effort into lately on informing people about the benefits of hunting with a muzzle loader, because all mm-hmm. the reasons that I started doing it are as true or even more valid now than they were 10 years ago, as far as getting away from the crowds when you're hunting because most of these new hunters are out there probably hunting with a rifle, maybe with a bow. I'd say very few people uh, that are brand new anyway are starting to hunt with a muzzle loader this year. And the ease of getting your supplies, um, you know, it's, I know it can be tough doing it with a muzzle loader compared to 2018 or 2019, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's easier to find muzzle loader stuff now than it is center fire rifle cartridges and <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, no uh, joke. these days. And then just you know, the number of people that are out there in the woods. And so I started a, a course in a training uh, process where I'll take called muzzle loaders 101, where I'll take someone that wants to learn how to hunt with a muzzle loader and I'll show you how to legally, how to determine what you can hunt with legally and wherever you're going to be hunting. Cause mm-hmm. guys can vary so much from state to state to state. For sure. Uh, just, you know, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho got their own thing going. Colorado's got a lot of weird rules and then Texas is all the way on the other end. So there's things that you can use in one state that aren't legal in the other. Yeah. And so I'll help you navigate that. I'll help you decide what is effective uh, for whatever the animals and circumstances that you're going to be hunting under. Like I described earlier, you know, there's times that ma- using that CVA Optima with a 250 grain power belt aerolite is an absolutely fantastic load. Mm. Um, and about as good as that you can get. We're great on the javelina. I think it's a great deer hunting load, but there's a lot also times that I don't think that's the, the best situation. And maybe using the paramount would be a better, uh, uh, a better choice. Maybe using a Barnes or a Thor bullet would be a better choice. And so, um, I'll help you, uh, navigate. Like I said, okay, this is what I'm going to be hunting and where, what makes sense for me to be using there. And I go into a lot of detail on the methodology methodology that I use for that and the reasoning that I use behind it and help you match what's legal with what's effective. And then I'll just teach you how to use it all safely and effectively and, and share a lot of the lessons that I've learned hunting with a muzzle loader over the years that um, it's not a gigantic change from hunting with a rifle, but there's a lot of things that you do need to keep in mind with a muzzle loader that wouldn't even cross my mind with, uh, hunting with a rifle Yeah, uh, that, that if you know that stuff, it's going to give you uh, an advantage moving forward. And then in addition to all of that stuff, you know, I've, I've got an exclusive deal with muzzleloaders.com where everyone that buys the course uh, gets a discount on all the gear that they buy from you guys. So I'll help you find everything that you need, buy it and save money when you do it and teach you how to use it safely and effectively while you're, uh, while you're out hunting. So the Muzzle Loaders 101 course is an all in, all in one solution where I'll guide you through the whole process of getting started hunting with a muzzle loader, help you decide what gear you need, help you save money when you buy that gear, and teach you how to use all that stuff safely and effectively at the range and out in the woods. So if you're considering learning to hunt with a muzzle loader, or if you already hunt with one and you just want to take your game to the next level, then take advantage of this opportunity. Right? Due to all of the craziness that's been going on lately in 2020 and 2021. More people are hunting than ever before, and using a muzzle loader can give you unique access to special seasons and hunting areas where the hunting pressure is lower. Like, like in the case of Havelina, you got that ham hunt, and there's you know desi- designated muzzle loader seasons for all sorts of other animals in different states as well. Mm. And hunting with a muzzle loader is also just really 
fulfilling and enjoyable. It's a lot of fun to uh, enjoy the outdoors and expand your hunting opportunities. And, you know, like I talked about with that, uh, with that javelina, I would rather at this point uh, use a muzzle loader and get in into 30 yards and, and shoot one like that than I would shooting one at 200 yards with my 300 wind mag. Yeah. Nothing wrong with doing that, but I just think it's uh, more fun to get in closer. But nowhere else do you find such a comprehensive resource for learning how to use a muzzle loader where you can also save some serious money getting outfitted. I normally charge 47 bucks for the course, but I'm offering it at a discount right now to all the listeners of the Muzzle Loaders podcast. And if you sign up while it's still valid, I'll get life, you will get lifetime access to everything for a one time payment of $35. So if that sounds appealing to you, go to muzzleloaders101.com slash buy, B U Y, and sign up to get started. That's muzzleloaders101.com slash buy. That's awesome. 35 bucks like for lifetime access. That's incredible. <laughs> Normally it's like a subscription and it's one of these deal. things too where I'm, I'm uh, continually updating it as well. You know, so I'll, I'll uh, release a, some updated videos here soon to take advantage to, to take into account, you know, just changes in the muzzle loader industry and all that stuff and products that have gone away and, and other ones that uh, have come out in the meantime. And like I said, I'll continue to do that. And, but yeah, my goal is to, to help you be a, a more effective hunter. And one of the really good ways you can do that is to either start hunting with a muzzle loader or do it more and more effectively than what you're doing right now. For sure. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm glad you I'm glad you're able to offer that resource. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a really good deal. You know, I've had some really um, great interactions with with the people that have bought the course that I've got uh, that I've met uh, through it. Because in addition to all that stuff, I run a private Facebook group as well where um, I can interact with people and a answer some more specific questions mm -hmm. on their uh, specific circumstances that uh, I don't necessarily get into in the course. And actually, there was a guy um, that uh, I was talking to here recently. He bought the course six months ago uh, because he drew a limited entry muzzleloader elk tag in Utah mm -hmm. and um, he'd been putting in for 20 years for this hunt, decided to put in with a muzzle loader this year, drew the tag. He bought a CBA Paramount. I showed him all the ropes on how to use it. A lot of the tips and tricks that I've learned, uh, as I, as I kind of worked out the kinks with my Paramount Yeah. and, uh, he was shooting great groups with it. And, um, I gave him some tips on how to use it in the field. He just got back from his hunt, um, this past Saturday and he shot a really nice bull on that hunt with his paramount and uh one shot and it says it ran like 15 yards afterwards and put it down so uh, wow. that's an example of a guy here just recently i was able to help that had never shot a muzzle loader before and now he's got a giant elk that's on the wall all all thanks to that that's awesome that's awesome well and we we love working with you because that's our passion too like we want to make sure that people like know how awesome muzzle loading is and how awesome muzzle loader hunting is and then help them get there so you know, it's really exciting that we're able to, to work with you on that. Yeah, I really enjoy it too. And, you know, I, uh, I don't know if that 7% uh, statistic holds true uh, with, you know, every state and all of that stuff, but it's got to be pretty darn close Yeah, uh, sure. to the situation in Washington with, with the, with, with the situation elsewhere. And, um, you know, there's not, you know, like with the guy I was just telling you about in Utah, you know, he, he drew a really good uh, muzzle loader tag with, uh, uh, with the number of points that he had. And he probably wouldn't have been able to draw that tag uh, on a rifle hunt uh, mm -hmm. this year in, in Utah, but, um, but, but he was able to do it with a muzzle loader. So that's a way, that's a way in certain states and certain circumstances where you can go hunting a couple of years sooner than you would have otherwise. And, For sure, and even yeah. if you're like I was in, in Georgia or in Washington, uh, you get out there and um, there's not as many people out there during the muzzleloader season as there would be during archery or, or rifle season. Yeah, that's definitely true. That's one of the biggest appeals is just, you know, especially with there's, te you know, point creep and all that stuff in a lot of states now where, I mean, there's some like, you know, our Mount Emily archery, I'll probably never draw that tag, you know, because it's 20 years and, the, you know, it goes up by a year every year. So, <laughs> Um, oh you know. geez that's so frustrating when that happens it is it is and it's nice because muzzle loading allows you to escape some of that like I was saying antelope takes about 20 years with a rifle but here in Oregon if you want an antelope tag with a muzzle loader it's only like a three or four year draw so um, 
Oh wow! Yeah, oh, significant, man, significant de- decrease. Yeah, so yeah, there's and there's that's just one example. There's opportunities like that in muzzleloading across several states. You know, so yeah, definitely. You know, there've been. I'm at the point now where I apply. I don't know, maybe six or seven states every year, and um, in almost every situation, um, I will apply for a mix of rifle and muzzleloader tags. Mm-hmm. And there have been some years where. Um, the the fact that I applied for that muzzleloader tag was the difference between me going out hunting or sitting at home uh, during hunting season because oh, wow. I didn't because I didn't even get the tag. Yeah, and uh, I think that's going to be even more important uh, going forward. For sure. Yeah. Awesome. Well, did you have anything else you wanted to share with us today? You know, so like I said, muzzleloaders one hundred one dot com slash buy. You can also check out my podcast, the Big Game Hunting Podcast. Everywhere the podcasts are um, are uh, are available, I talk about a lot of stuff with muzzle loaders on there, uh, but a lot, also a lot of uh, hunting in Africa and hunting with centerfire rifles and that sort of thing. I talk about my experiences. I talk about these cartridge comparisons. Mm-hmm. I talk about muzzle loader gear and whatnot, and I also just interview a lot of uh, interesting people in the industry, um, talking about elk hunting, moose hunting, hunting in Africa bear hunting all kinds of of, uh, of of stuff there there's something for everyone in in some of these episodes so regardless of whether you hunt with a rifle or a muzzleloader or both in the u.s in africa um it's a it's a great show for all of that stuff so the big game hunting podcast and then my blog is the big game hunting blog.com and a lot of the same content there that i have on the podcast and all, all of that stuff and that's uh that's where you know i i, I published a tremendous amount of content uh, between the podcast and the blog. And um, like I said, you'll probably find something that you like on, uh, on either one of them. Perfect. Yeah. And uh, I was checking out your content right before, you know, before the show. And obviously we've worked for a long time and able to get to see a lot of the stuff you've been able to do and it is excellent stuff. So definitely check it out. Um, great resources, lots of excellent information. So definitely check out the big game hunting blog and big game hunting podcast. And, uh, yeah, I think that's about all I had too. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comments below. Remember to hit that like and subscribe button for more awesome content. And if you're listening to just the audio version, leave us a review because that is going to help get this content and information into the hands of the people that need it. It really helps out the show. Uh, And we will see you guys on the next episode. 